got so quiet. I'm a little, <laughs> a little unsure of what to do. Well, people of God, as we continue to prepare our hearts uh, to receive God's word this morning, let's go to God in a word of prayer. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Lord, you are our rock, and you are our redeemer. And all of God's people together said, Amen. 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 Friends of Christ, uh, this morning we get to continue our walk through the book of Esther. Uh, so we are on Esther chapter 4 this morning, and when we last left the story, things were at their worst. If you were with us last week, we talked about how this is kind of uh, one of the low points in this entire story. King Xerxes, uh, the king over 127 provinces, uh, and his, one of his powerful advisors named Haman. Uh, a couple of you over here know that we boo Haman when we hear about him, right? Uh, and so King Xerxes and that other guy, who I won't say his name, uh, they've made a plan to wipe out the entire Jewish population in King Xerxes' kingdom. Okay, in all 127 provinces. And at the end of chapter 3, they have issued a decree that on this one particular day, 12 months in the future, every single Jewish person must be killed and annihilated. Okay, that's the language that's used. And at the end of chapter 3, we see Xerxes and Haman. Yeah, we're getting there. Uh, we see those two uh, kind of sitting back and drinking and being very proud of themselves, but we see all the rest of the people in these provinces thrown into uncertainty. And so today, as we read on in the story, as we kind of find ourselves at the lowest point, we get to see the reactions of two of our main characters in this story, Mordecai and Esther. And the question that has to be ringing on our hearts is, what on earth are they going to do? What's the response going to be to this evil that has been put out there, to this edict that has been declared? Now remember, before we read chapter 4, a little bit of a reminder about who Mordecai and Esther are. Uh, Mordecai and Esther are both Jewish people who are living in exile. They, they're living under the reign of King Xerxes, uh, and Esther has become the queen. So through a whole big series of events in chapter 2, Esther is now Queen Esther, a Jewish queen serving in the kingdom of King Xerxes, a non-Jewish king. Uh, and Mordecai has a place uh, somewhere in the citadel of Susa, somewhere near there where he has access to different things. Uh, but as we, what we're going to read today in chapter 4 is how Esther and Mordecai respond to the evil that's being done in their midst. So if you'd like to, you can follow along. Uh, otherwise, you can just listen. I'm going to be reading Esther chapter 4. I'm going to read the whole thing. Uh, and then we'll walk through some different things together. Uh, so friends in Christ, let's listen to the Word of God together this morning. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. But he, only, but he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews. With fasting, weeping, and wailing, many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to urge her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. 
Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, All the king's officials and people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the gold scepter to him and spare his life. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther <clears throat> sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. People of God, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In this chapter, we have perhaps the most familiar and often quoted verse and line from this entire book. Mordecai says to Esther, and who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. It's Mordecai's last appeal for Esther to help, and it works. And as we listen to that appeal, and as we listen to the events of this chapter, we can't forget about the dark cloud that hangs over Esther and Mordecai at this time. Okay, we can't forget about the dark cloud of chapters 2 and 3. The dark cloud hanging over their heads, if you remember, in chapter 2, we saw women from all across Xerxes' kingdom being forced to come and spend the night with him and then stay uh, with him and not be able to go back to their families. We saw human trafficking in action in chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, we of course see this edict being put out. This plan for genocide, the wiping out of an entire group based solely on their ethnicity. So this dark cloud of, of all of these really terrible things that have happened is hanging over Esther and Mordecai. And the question for us as readers, as we're reading along in this story, is what on earth are they going to do? What are they going to do with this dark cloud hanging over them? What's their response? going to be? How are they going to handle this? And there's two responses that we see in chapter 4 that I want us to pay attention to today. The first response that we see here in chapter 4 uh, is lament. Okay, the first response is lament. Right away in verse 1, if you still have your Bibles open, it says this, when Mordecai learned of all that had been done, so all of the edict and everything like that. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes, he put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. Mordecai is lamenting. He's publicly uh, lamenting this edict that has been decreed. Uh, he does this uh, in a couple of by doing a couple of different things. Right, he tears his clothes. Uh, which we see often in the Old Testament. It's a very significant action because they didn't have necessarily tons and tons of clothes that they were choosing from in their closets in the morning. So to tear your clothes was to destroy some of your own property. Uh, he puts on sackcloth and ashes. Uh, again, those are symbols of mourning. Sackcloth is this rough, thick, burlap kind of cloth. And ashes are the symbol of destruction. Right? So he puts on sackcloth and ashes. And he goes out into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. He's literally just giving voice to his pain, giving voice to his distress. 
I think for us today, as we read through this story, this seems pretty normal. Right? This seems like kind of a normal thing that people do in the Old Testament. So we kind of say, okay, that's right, sackcloth and ashes, that kind of thing. All right, what happens next? But it's important for us to stop, to pause, and to understand what's happening here. To understand the fact that in the face of immense, unspeakable evil, in the face of genocide, okay, the first thing that Mordecai does is to lament, to give voice to his pain, to express and to name his pain, to recognize it, okay, to share it with others. He doesn't try and hide it. He doesn't try and push it away. He doesn't try and pretend like everything is just fine. I think this is important for us to notice uh, because how often is our instinct the exact opposite of that, right? How often is our instinct to pretend that everything's okay in the face of great evil, in the face of great pain or suffering in our own lives? How easy is it for us to just put on our nice clothes, put on our happy smiles and say, no, we're okay, right? How easy is it for us to kind of sweep all these things under the rug, to try and keep it together, if you will, to dismiss the evil in the world, to dismiss the pain in our lives, to say it's not a big deal, to say to justify it somehow, to generally just take all these big feelings that we're having and that we can't be having and just stuff them down, right? Those of us who grew up uh, Dutch and Reformed are really, really good at this. This is a skill that we have learned, okay? Take all of those big feelings and you don't express them. You don't talk about them. You don't share them with anybody else. You take them up in a little ball and you push them down as far as you can, right? Friends of Christ, that is not what we see happening here. We are not very good at lament. We are not very good at naming and expressing evil in the world. We are not very good at naming and expressing and voicing our own pain. I think one of the reasons that we're taught to kind of stuff all this stuff down uh, is I think for some reason, at some point along the line, at least for myself, uh, I kind of learned, uh, just intrinsically, that, that voicing my pain, saying that something was wrong, was somehow unfaithful to God. Somehow represented a lack of faith on my part. Like if I complained about anything in my life, if I complained about anything happening in the world, it was seen as some sort of lack of faith in God's working. Some sort of lack of faith in what God is doing. And so I was taught uh, to just keep it to myself. To just be quiet, and to trust, and to have faith. I don't know if that's true for you, but that's certainly been true for me in my life. But as we look at Scripture, as we see the example of Mordecai this morning, we see a completely different picture. Scripture, our scriptures are full of lament. Okay, what we see Mordecai doing here is lament, tearing his clothes, crying and wailing loudly throughout the public square. If we were to keep reading on, we're told that the Jewish people all across Xerxes' kingdom did the exact same thing. Right? They went into this time of lamenting what has been happening. Uh, we see it, uh, all sorts of characters throughout the Old and New Testament, mourning, crying, weeping, voicing pain. Uh, if we look at the book of Psalms, okay, this, this book of 150 different psalms right in the middle of our scriptures, there are more psalms of lament than there are any other type of psalm. There's more psalms of lament than there are thanksgiving uh, or anything like that. Okay? The, the most frequent psalm you will see is a psalm of lament. There's actually an entire book in our Bible called Lamentations. Literally, a book of laments. Okay? Scripture models for us this pattern and this rhythm of voicing our pain, of not pushing it down, not casting it aside, but giving voice to it and expressing it to God. Because the reality of life is that there is pain. Hey, I don't have to tell all of you that. We know that. We feel that. We experience that. Uh, sometimes on a daily basis, right? Life is full of pain. The world is full of evil. There's all sorts of bad stuff out there in the world, and we are invited, through witnessing what Mordecai and Esther do here, we are invited not to brush it aside. We're invited not to make light of it. Uh, we're invited not to push all of our feelings down, but we are invited to lament, to give voice to our emotions, 
to give voice to our own experience, to join in with the chorus of everyone we see in Scripture saying, you know what? This pain is real. You know what? What I'm experiencing is real. You know what? What we're seeing happening in the world, whatever it might be, is wrong. To voice that, to lament that, to give it language and words and expression, it's important and it's good work for us as Christians to do. And when we do that, friends, when we lament, when we voice our pain and emotion, when we voice our opposition to evil in the world, it often leads to the second response that we see here in Esther chapter 4. So the first response to this great big evil is to lament, right? And then the second response that we see from Mordecai and Esther is to take action. Okay? Second response to great evil in the world that we see them doing is to take action. By the end of this chapter, Esther has agreed to put her life at risk to help the Jewish people. But of course there are a few steps in getting there. As we read through this, we see Esther and Mordecai having this, this kind of back and forth conversation through this third party, Hathak, uh, one of Esther's servants. Uh, and initially, Esther's just trying to discover what Mordecai is lamenting about. Mordecai sends word back about the edict and, and asks her, he says, hey, go to the king. Beg for mercy. Help our people. Esther says to him, hey, you know that's against the law, right? And you know that I could get killed for this, right? She isn't sure if this is a good idea. She has a little bit of hesitance when Mordecai first puts this idea out there. But then Mordecai, in this next response, uh, reminds her that uh, it is her people who will be hurt, but it is also her. And he has this great little line in there where he says, if salvation doesn't come from your actions, it will arise from somewhere else. He's essentially saying, uh, even though he doesn't invoke or mention the name of God, he's essentially saying, God's going to save his people. God's going to do what God's going to do, Esther, and if you're not in on it, God will find some other means. And then he says this, this phrase that still resounds today, right? Who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Mordecai is essentially reminding Esther uh, that salvation will bring God, or God will bring salvation, excuse me, uh, and that God has placed Esther in this position of privilege and power so that God might use her for the sake of her people, for the sake of others. And after this, Esther says, all right, I'll do it. She says, I understand that I'm breaking the law. Uh, I understand that I'm, I might perish. If I perish, I perish, she says, but I will do it. Esther takes her privilege and her power, her unique position that she has as queen, the fact that, that she even has access to the king, and she commits to using that on behalf of others. Think about it. It could have been very easy for Esther just to stay hidden and to stay comfortable in her life as queen. She hadn't revealed her nationality yet. She hadn't revealed that she was of the Jewish people. She was kind of fitting in with everybody else. Uh, she probably had all of the comforts that she could ever want. She had servants. She had food. She had all this stuff. And she puts it all at risk to help her people. People of God, what an example this is for us today. I think if we're honest with ourselves, uh, the majority of us here, as we're gathered here this morning, have a lot of privilege in our society and have a lot of power in our society. We, we are generally people, I don't want to speak for everybody, but we are generally people who have what we need. We have homes, we have foods, we have income, we have power, we have connections, we have all of these different things. We do. Right? You might not feel it all the time. You might look at other people and say, boy, they, they're more powerful than I am, or whatever it might be. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, those of us gathered here this morning, many to most of us gathered here this morning, have some sort of privilege and some sort of power in this world today. And so the question for us then becomes, what are we going to do with it? The question is the same as it is for Esther. We've been given all of these gifts. We've been given all of these blessings. The question is, in the face of great evil in the world, what are we going to do with this power and this privilege that we have? Will we use it to keep ourselves safe? Will we use it to kind of hide away and to not engage with the evil of the world? 
we use it for our own gain, to get a little bit more power, and a little bit more security for ourselves? Or will we follow the example of Esther? Will we put ourselves at risk to speak up for those in danger, to speak up for people uh, who can't speak for themselves all the time, who don't have the same power and privilege that we have. The question for us as we read Esther chapter 4 is what will our response be to the evil that we see in the world today? I think this chapter also points us to Jesus. Right? It points us to Christ. What was Christ's response when uh, he saw us go astray? What was Christ's response when uh, he saw us dying in our own sin and shame? His response was uh, to empty himself of all the love, and to take on human flesh, to become one of us, and to give literally everything for us, to give his life for us, to be separated from his heavenly Father so that we might have life. Christ put himself at risk for us. He showed us the way of self-sacrificing love uh, in, in the same way that Esther is doing here. So the question then rings louder in our heads and in our hearts. What will we do in response to the evil that we see in the world today? I want to make this just a little bit more practical for us. Uh, in, in the book of Esther, uh, Xerxes has made this decree to uh, annihilate an entire group of people based solely on their ethnicity. It is a racially charged edict. At its core, it is racism. It's what is happening here in Esther. It is genocide against an entire group of people because of their ethnicity. Plain and simple. And Esther and Mordecai's response to racism was to do something. To speak up on behalf of a group of people who were in danger. Now what about us? Let's think about our world today. I don't think we can deny that racism is no longer, that racism doesn't have a place in our world today. Right? I don't think we can look around and say, nope, no problems with racism here anymore, okay? I don't think that's a fair thing to do. Over the course of, of many of your lifetimes, we have seen this issue come up over and over again. In the last number of years, the last couple of years, we've seen white nationalist marches. We've seen racially motivated killings. We've heard talk about Nazis in the news cycle. Hey, this is where we are again today. This topic of race is at the forefront of our minds and our attentions. And there's people from all sorts of different sides of the political spectrum. Okay, I'm not trying to make this about that. Uh, but there's people yelling at each other and arguing about each other, about whose fault it is, and, and it's there, and it's not there, and all of this different stuff. Racism is alive and well in our world today. Okay? It's a truth that we have to be aware of. And so my question for us this morning is what do we do about it? What will you do about it? What will you do about this evil that you see happening in the world around you? Will you lament and take action? Or will you deny the problem, kind of sweep it under the rug, justify it, rationalize it, not bother ourselves with it because it doesn't affect my life all that much? Now, I want to be clear, I'm just using racism as one example, okay? Because it's what we see so clearly here in Esther is motivating this genocide. We could fill in that blank with any number of atrocities in the world, okay? Poverty, hunger, war, uh, idol worship. We can fill in the blank with any of these things. When we look at the world around us, we see evil. We see terrible things happening all the time. And the question has to be this morning, what will we do about it? The question I want you to ask yourself is, what will you do in response to these things? Will we be people who bury our heads in the sand? Will we be people who use our, our power and our privilege and our gifts and our resources to, to keep ourselves safe and protect ourselves? Or will we follow the example of Esther and ultimately follow the example of Christ in giving up our comforts and giving up our own safety for the sake of others? Will we follow the path of self-sacrificial love for those around us? 
Esther and Mordecai this morning invite us to do just that. It's the invitation to join in what God is already doing. Uh, we're told in the book of Colossians that in Jesus Christ, God is reconciling all things to himself. The truth, uh, as Mordecai expresses it, is that God is at work against evil in the world. Racism, war, poverty, idol worship, all of those things will have their end because of God. And will have their end because of Christ. The question is, will we join God in what God is doing? How will we respond to the evil that we see in the world? People of God, my prayer for us today is that uh, we will be people who have our eyes open to this, and people who have the courage and the grace and the compassion and the love to be able to follow in the way of Esther and ultimately in the way of Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, we come to you today as people who don't always recognize the great evil in the world. Uh, as people who uh, maybe sweep things under the rug or push down our responses or emotions, whatever it might be. God, we confess that to you uh, and we pray that your spirit would transform us today. We pray, God, that we would be people who have our eyes wide open. Uh, we pray that we would be people of compassion. Uh, people of love, people who follow the example of Esther, who walk in the way of Jesus. And so God, we, uh, we do lament the evil that we see at work in our world today. We lament that, that racism is real and that people are discriminated against simply because of who they are or the color of their skin. We lament uh, unending war that takes people's homes and livelihoods away. We lament uh, poverty that leaves people without basic necessities, food and water, a place to lay their heads at night. We lament uh, the idols in our lives that we put in place of you. God, we lament all of these things and we ask for your spirit to show us how to respond, to show us what to do, to show us how to use the gifts that we have been given, the, the blessings that you have so freely and richly poured out on every one of us, God. How can we use those blessings? Send us your spirit to answer that question. Send us your spirit to give us eyes to see uh, and, and, and feet to walk in your way and in your path. So now, God, as we respond to this word, as we give our gifts, and our offerings, as we sing, as we lift up our, our friends and our community in prayer, and as we're sent out into this world again, God, we pray that your spirit would guide us, and we pray that you would show us who you would have us be. We pray this all in the name of Jesus and all of God's people together said, Amen. Amen.